Hello, friends. Registration for next year's Exiles in Babylon conference is now open, and I cannot wait for this conference. Here are some topics we're going to wrestle with. The future of the church, disability in the church, multi-ethnic perspectives on American Christianity, and a dialogical debate on the problem of evil and suffering. We're still finalizing some of our speakers, but so far we've got uh, Matt Chandler, Eugene Cho, Greg Boyd. Greg's going to be, he's going to be engaging in the dialogical debate on the problem of evil with Clay Jones from Talbot School of Theology. We've got Lamar Hardwick and Devin Stahl talking about disability. Uh, Michelle Sanchez from the ECC is going to be talking about the future of the church. Anna Ross is going to give her perspective on a Native American perspective on American Christianity. And of course, we've got Ellie Bonilla and Street Hymns backed by popular demand, along with Tanika Wyatt and Evan Wickham, who will be leading our multi-ethnic worship service again. And <laughs> I can't believe there's another and. And we're going to have a pre-conference, a scholarly conversation about women in ministry featuring, you know, I don't know, Lynn Kohick, Scott McKnight, a couple of other complementarian scholars who they're going to be dialoguing with. And I'm currently solidifying the details on that. So stay tuned. So March 23rd to 25th, 2023 here in Boise, Idaho, we sold out last year. So we'll probably sell out next year as well. So register sooner than later. If you plan on coming, you can always attend virtually if you can't make it in person. All the info is at theologyintheraw.com. That's theologyintheraw.com. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. My guest today is Jeremy Stevens. Uh, Jeremy is one of the uh, founders of the Tampa Underground, a really interesting um, community of micro churches. And we talk a lot about what the Tampa Underground is, so I don't need to say any more here. Um, Jeremy is a super sharp, wise guy who is also very humble. And I really appreciated his thoughts on um, the church, how to rethink kind of what we mean as uh, as we say we do church or go to church or are the church or whatever. Like he spent a lot of time, you know, just re- thinking these, rethinking these categories through a biblical lens. And uh, he'll be the first one to say their model is not the only model, but I found it incredibly interesting, especially for those of us who, you know, might be a little disenchanted with some more traditional forms with how we go about doing church. You will really enjoy this conversation. So please welcome to the show for the first time, the one and only. Jeremy Stevens. All right. Hey, friends. I'm here with a brand new friend, Jeremy Stevens, uh, who we met through a friend of a friend just online. And I, um, Jeremy, first of all, thank you for coming on Theology and Raw. I'm actually, not actually, (laughs) that sounds so bad. I'm actually looking forward to it. But like, I've been a a fan from a distance from what you guys are doing out there at Tampa Underground. I've been wanting to have one of you guys on the podcast for a while. So thank you so much for being on the show. Oh man, appreciate you the invite. I, I also um do you know you know the Hirsches, right? The, they mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I think they I like well, over the last five years, I feel like every time I turn around, somebody's like, Oh, you guys you gotta talk to the Tampa Underground people. Like they're just doing really neat work out there. So why don't we start um let's yeah, the start positive with positive gossip. There's yeah. been some positive gossip. <laughs> positive. Let's start with who you are as a person quickly and then um, would love to have you unpack what T- Tampa Underground is, and then I'm sure that'll open yeah. up loads of questions. Yeah, yeah. So, so I've been uh, just following Jesus since uh, really 19 years old. Grew up in the Missouri City Lutheran Church, so okay. I had kind of some high church kind of uh, uh, you know exposure, but was not a follower of, of Jesus until uh, 19. And then in that experience, got discipled through InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Studied the Bible for the first time inductively, actually tried to apply it, actually tried to like build a community and love one another. And it was in those formative years that there was this sense of like, we're really trying to be the book of Acts. Like we're not trying to uh, p- play games, you know, there, there was – because it was InterVarsity Christian Fellowship it, in its parachurch, it, it felt very untethered in the sense it didn't have other traditions it had to follow. Like – do this because that's what we do. It was more like, no, we're doing this because the Bible says so. And and because of that, even in, in our, you know, simplistic understandings and, and kind of young faith, there's, oh, it seems like Jesus cares for the poor. It seems like he cares about like topics like maybe racial reconciliation and uh, redistribution of wealth. And so we're influenced by John Perkins. And, mm. the, and then you, you, a pocket of us moved into the city, uh, kind of uh, the worst part of, of Tampa. Um, so we're doing college ministry, sharing the gospel, 
proclaiming good news, kind of cross-resurrection kind of stuff, but then also going overseas and learning from the, the poorest of the poor and saying, you know, teach us the ways of Jesus, but then also moving into the city and doing tutoring programs, but also learning from our neighbors. What does it mean to, like, follow Jesus? So our posture has been very – we are just trying to be disciples. We're trying to be this thing that we see in the Scripture, but that also – takes us to all these crazy places, you know, cracks and crevices in our in our city. And it's more than just the college student ministry. It, it, it began there, but it very quickly just spills out. You just go, but God's concerns are like everywhere. <laughs> he, he, you know, he's concerned about so many things and he's inviting us into that. Uh, from that place, we, we just said, man, you know, and this, my journey as one of the original founders is, is, is just closely tied. So it's kind of like, my story and the underground story, kind of, it's all in parallel. Um, we, I just remember you going, it's got to be more, right? You know, like you go on the Sunday morning thing and you go, okay, this is a good Barney sing-along time. And sometimes, like, I feel it. But then sometimes I'm going, hey, I study the Bible too, and that's not what this passage is talking <laughs> about. And uh, have you worked with any poor people? Because what the heck is this budget? And... You know, we're doing missions in making disciples, but none of that's validated because we're not volunteering underneath the banner of this this church or denomination or something. And so that all that seemed like very disconnected from our our what we were experiencing as missionaries in the streets and on the in the campus. And that began the process of going, is there something more to this thing called church or ecclesia? And it was that journey that really started the underground and um you know so lived in the city for now since 97 me and my wife got married we raised our kids here um you know we've just kind of planted ourselves long obedience same direction mm -hmm. you know planted many micro churches now that we you know we use that term back in 2001 we didn't use that term we we're just like okay these things i guess they're a house church but it just seemed right for us to meet and love our neighbors and worship Jesus and love one another. It was very messy from the first kind of 2000, 2005. Then we started getting some language. We're like, okay, microchurch. I think that's a word we can use to describe what's what's evolving so among not, us. So not house you know? church. You don't uh, own the label house church, even if some people might describe what you're doing that way. It's microchurch. And what, what, what's, what, how would you <clears throat> do, uh, unpack the differences there? Why microchurch and not house church? Yeah, well, we, we read Wolfgang Simpson. And we said, oh, thank you. That's very helpful. So we were like, okay, I guess what we're doing is house churches. But very quickly, uh, we recognized there's these things that seem to be church to us, that seem to be the body of Christ, that seem to be ecclesia, that don't mean in a house, that don't like have proximity to a home, okay. that maybe aren't even planted in a neighborhood. And so so that that just forced us to go, there's, there's more, there's like a larger label here. I think biblically it would be ecclesia, would be church, would be the largest label. But unfortunately, in our context, if you use that word mm -hmm. alone, it, it just seems to mean something else, like a, some kind of authority structure or some type of particular steeple or preacher or pulpit or something like that. And so we said we got to get away from that somehow. But what if we add the prefix micro to it? Because we wanted to honor the small. Okay. I mean, most churches in history are small. Uh, throughout all of Christian history, which oftentimes go uncounted because they are so small. But if there's small groups of believers everywhere throughout history doing stuff in the name of Jesus. And so we just said, man, we, we want to really elevate that and say, we, we just want to be the church in all its forms. And is there a way to honor all of that? So micro church would be maybe the, the largest label. And then we'd say, hey, if that looks like a house church, great. And you could call it a house church. You don't have to call it a micro okay. church. Um, if you want to call it a, a, you know, a small group, that's great. We don't, we don't care, you know. Mm -hmm. And so for us, micro church is defined worship, community, mission. It that, that would be our ecclesial minimum. It has to have those three things for it to Wait, be say it recognizable. Again? Uh, worship, community, and mission. Okay. So those three things. Um, which a lot of folks have have something similar to that, and but we just really believe like that's that seems to be the church, and out of that minimum can grow something more complicated. It could it could have paid staff, or it could have insurance or boards. It could be a nonprofit looking thing, or it could just stay in a living room, reaching neighbors, hmm. loving the lost in our missional spheres. 
Uh, so it gives a, it, that term microchurch in the ecclesial minimum allows for what we call expansive ecclesiology. So you could have ecclesia forms in many different ways. It still be the church, but if you lose one of those minimums, then it, we're not saying it's evil. We're just saying it might not be what the Bible's referring to as church. Okay. Um, and then, you know, then we could have a conversation about that. Like, it's great. You should have a worshiping community. Like, get together and play songs and love each other. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. That's not bad. It's it's just maybe not what the Bible's inviting us into right. when it says ecclesia. You know? Can you give me a, a real concrete picture? Like if somebody went out there and spent a month yeah. in the day-to-day rhythm of Tampa Underground, like what would that look like? Or maybe a week, so just so you don't have 30 days to kind of spell out. Like, <laughs> and, and really, like just so um, – and, and I'm really looking for like, what are the kind of maybe more unique features that somebody might experience? Like, oh, this this feels different than what I grew up, you know, experiencing in, in church, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So th- there's two aspects to that. So there's the life in the microchurches, which are decentralized from any okay. kind of uh, central authority power structures. So the forms are going to look really different. You could go hang out with Mom Africana, which is mentoring black middle school girls, uh, and they have rhythms and practices to be worship community mission that fit that context and fit that those leaders who are called to that to be the church in that way. You come hang out with my microchurch, which is what we would call a distributive microchurch. So it's it's exists as a worshiping community, but it has missional spheres that are outside that that are different from one another. So one guy's a nine one one call center guy, so he's trying to like bring the kingdom and cultivate Eden in that context, you know. Um, you know, one guy's a firefighter. We have three teachers that are part of my microchurch. My wife is a doula, so she's working with kind of vulnerable mothers who are in the birthing process and kind of that thin space of, of giving birth. So you can hang out with us and, you know, dinner and Bible study. And <laughs> some stuff looks very ordinary, very like, oh, common to Christian experience. Okay. But it would take like a month or a couple months and you would go, this seems very simple, very like – What's so special about this? But I guarantee you over the course of six months, as we walk through marriages, as we as we are walking with the lost and with the poor, you would go, oh, wait, this is the power of God. And mm-hmm. so it really is that mustard seed principle, like something small can actually be quite powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, you can hang out with Stacy Hester and Solo Moms. These are single mothers. And, you know, she's got you know clothing closets all over the city that she's kind of set up. And she has a pet raccoon. Uh, it's, it, she's wild, man. Didn't see that and coming. <laughs> yeah, she leash? yeah, she's yeah. <laughs> walks it around. <laughs> yeah, no, man. I mean, she like lets it crawl all over, man. It's a she's a, she's wild, and that's still things can dimension. those things got claws. That is it declawed? I mean, they they'll, they'll mix it up, man. Raccoons? Are no, like, Stacey Hester's like she's a boss. Like wow. she just tells that raccoon what to do, and it <laughs> listens. I like we'll have Zoom calls sometimes. It's like a, especially when COVID first started out, and there was like a raccoon in the background just crawling around her head. <laughs> she was sitting on the couch, and we we're trying to talk about Jesus. And I'm like, wait, time out. Is is there a raccoon? Are you okay? Like, are you? Is that? Do you know there's an animal like behind you? Like, watch out, Stacy. And oh, uh, she she was like, no, that's my pet. Like, oh my word, you're. you're you're even crazy. She told a story one time, man. She was she was kind of giving a testimony at one of our gatherings, and she just said, man, you know, God is so good. And she's just talking about these clothing drop-in things that she was setting up and all these moms she's working with and some of the trials that she's having with her landlord. And, you know, because all this ministry stuff's happening and the landlord's not entirely happy with all this activity. And then, and then she just kind of very quickly just like – I, you know, and 32 people started following Jesus this year, and and we all of us kind of like stopped her, like interrupted her. <clears throat> Say, you, Stacy, did you just say 32? And she said, "Well, it could have been more, but it's hard to count." Okay. And and we were just, and she just didn't even think it was special. She was just like just testifying to all that Jesus was doing in her life and through the ministry. So you hang out with her, and you might see somebody get saved. Who knows, right? Like someone coming to a, a you know a faith in Jesus is starting to follow Jesus. Um, so that's on the microchurch side. If you hang out with the central kind of gatherings, then you have these moments of like, um, you know, infrastructure and staff, and like saying, "Hey, we're trying to design products and services to serve microchurch leaders." So this weekend, we're going to have a leadership summit for 
microchurch leaders to come together and plan and get some get some external input. You know, because sometimes you need to stimulate theological expertise, share those theological expertise. You know, someone with a pet raccoon may not have read as many books, you know, as I have. You know, so it's like I'll share that knowledge and she could share with me how to tame raccoons or something. <laughs> right. So we can have a mutual so, kind of submission there. So there is a central gathering. How often do you meet? Where do you meet? Do you have a building? Um... Yeah, there's some central gatherings. Uh, so that's part of the. We're trying to create like a restaurant menu. Like, here's a menu, and then we hand that to a microchurch leader and say, "Hey, you you need to be the church you're called to be. Worship community mission. You've agreed to that. That's that's how you're a part of the underground network. Um, so there's kind of a basic understanding of what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. Um, and and now we hand you this menu and say, you tell us what what would help you be the church you're called to be. We have a leadership summit coming up next weekend. We have this prayer gathering on. Sunday, we have this coaching platform. Like you could get coaching and strategic help in, in developing your microchurch. We have financial services. So if you need to fundraise for your microchurch, don't keep it in a piggy bank or a cookie jar. Why don't you, you know, let us house your money and we'll do expense accounting for you so you stay out of jail. Um, so those type <laughs> of things, you know. Um, okay. So we, we're trying to create a restaurant menu. So we do have a facility so people could get kind of a co-working facility or they could reserve it to run their own events. So most of the events that are run out of our hub, especially pre-COVID, most of the events, I think I think it was 65 or 75 percent of the events were run by microchurches. Okay. Uh, so sometimes that was just a meeting. Sometimes it was a, they needed like a planning session. Sometimes they'd run full on worship gatherings and outreaches out of our facility and that facility is designed explicitly for them to use the infrastructure would still use some things like hey we're having a conference for microchurch leaders yeah. if that serves you why don't you come how, how um, big so, is that how many does it hold like I'm, <clears throat> I'm just trying to again picture when you do have some kind of central gathering is it 100 people is it 2000 somewhere in between or we can't get everybody to show up anywhere, man. Um, <laughs> it's a decentralized network. It's impossible. We like this is a really good restaurant menu, and they're like, "Yeah, I'm busy, you know, doing what God's called me to do." Uh, so they're, they're like, yeah. "Oh, always confused." But so uh, right now, kind of post COVID, there's still like a, um, I, I guess. This weekend will probably be a little bit larger, so it might be like 100 to 150 okay. people. So we have 80 microchurches in the network. Okay. But and many each, of the people in— hmm? Each one of those are what, like 10 to 30 people or on, on, on the micro side? Yeah, about 14, 14 okay. to 15 people okay. on average. Okay. So some are larger, some are smaller. Some are just getting started, so it's like three or four people, right? Um, some are getting ready to multiply, so they're— at I, I, right now, no one's really ready to multiply, kind of post COVID. Um, so no one's no one's at that that threshold level of thirty or forty people um, currently. Okay. But I think we're I think we're on the edge of a wave of of growth. So you know, next year we we may see a number of microchurches ready to multiply in, in that type okay. of way. Uh, so those gatherings are still pretty small. If we do a big conference. We, we might get hundreds of people, but then we'll just rent a facility because okay. our, our, our current hub, what we call a hub uh, headquarters, um, I mean, it could only hold – I mean, you could get maybe – you could squeeze 200. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, so if – um, how would what you're doing differ? I, I think I might know the answer to this, but I would love for you to unpack it <clears> like, you yeah. know, um, every traditional traditionally structured church I know – would not make well, most most traditionally structured yes. churches I know would would really promote like small groups, you know, and hey, it's yeah. not just a service, and you need to get plugged in, and here's a, a menu of small groups you can belong to. Um, how would you describe what you're doing is different, if it is different than mm-hmm. than that? Yeah, I think it, some of that comes down to just what do you actually define as church? So those kind of more traditional or prevailing models of the church would say that centralized thing is the church uh, and it has a particular hierarchy or authority structure. Mm -hmm. Whatever their governance structure is, it's still centered on that entity. Um, And we would say we actually don't think our infrastructure is the church at all. It doesn't contain worship, community, and mission. So 
the underground officially registered with the state of Florida, we see as a missions agency to serve the churches. So we might say in the prevailing model, we would look at the small groups and go, oh, that's actually the church in operation. This other thing, I don't know why you use the word church for it, you know, hmm. but uh, so that would be the main distinction. And it really has to do with agency and calling and what you actually define as church, because who wins the argument? If there's a conflict between microchurch scheduling and the infrastructure scheduling something, who wins? Well, the church should win. The church should have the agency to say, hey, we are called to be the church. Mm-hmm. We're going to go do X, Y, and Z. We, we had a leader. We had a leadership summit a few years ago. This leader was like, man, I really want to be there, but I— you know, I've scheduled this thing with 30 non-Christians to go down a river and just do tubing down a river, you know, <laughs> and, you know, my whole microchurch is going. We would love to participate in this thing that the underground is doing. But and he was in conflict. He was kind of like, I don't know what to do because he wanted to honor kind of like huh. the good stuff that was happening. But but we, we had to say back to him, hey, Nishu, you have to be the church you're called to be like. Mm-hmm. You're, you're the one that has to make this choice. You have the agency to choose to bring your whole group to this leadership summit or take them down a river with 30 non-Christians. You know? And of course, in the middle of our leadership summit, a bunch of our phones started blowing up. He was taking pictures on the river and be like, God is so good. He's doing all this stuff. You know, And, and it's like he's – so he could come to a leadership summit to plan, make plans to be the church for the fall semester. Mm. Or he could be busy – being the church he's called to be, you know, reaching Southeast Asian folks yeah. in Tampa, right? So he had all these like Southeast Asian folks, Hindus, non-Christians, right. Buddhists, floating down this river in the name of Jesus. You know, just I, that's the type of stuff where I go, we don't allow ourselves to tell Nishu what to do as an right. infrastructure. The authority rests on him to make those decisions, right? So that would be a major kind of point okay. of uh, a yeah, divergence yeah. so it's all it's all yeah. like the it's a inversion of emphasis in, in a sense yes. where somebody's church identity is in their micro church <clears throat> yeah. and whatever central thing they want to be a part of is kind of how a normal church would view the small groups like you know church is yes. sunday morning and that's a service and if you miss that the language we would use is you missed church um, that's right and then the small group attendance it's, it is still if, even in most churches even if it's emphasized yeah you you would you would still say like if somebody was going to church on Sunday and not part of the small group they say oh yeah he goes to church you know but he's not part of a small group they, they wouldn't say yeah. yeah he doesn't go to our church he just attends on Sunday <laughs> yeah that that's right it, it it is an inversion and and oftentimes uh, you know if you're lucky you would get eighty percent of those people to participate in a small group program well we'd be lucky to get eighty percent of the people to participate in our centralized infrastructure. Right. Mm -hmm. Like we would be over the moon. We'd be like, wow, that's really amazing. (laughs) You know, right now it's like, man, if we get 40 percent of people in microchurches to participate in our centralized infrastructure, what people recognize as the underground, that that's more normal for us. And Uh, I would. Yeah. Sorry, I keep cutting you off. I know there's a lag. in (laughs) There's just a ton of people that are in the microchurches that are participating in the life of the church. Yeah that are being discipled or being reached out to or being included into the that kind of the yeah. environments where the aroma of Christ is present that don't even know the underground exists. They, wow. The microchurch is a part of the underground, but the people in the microchurch sometimes don't even know the mic, that the underground exists. All they know is this expression of the people of, of Jesus, you know. And when you uh, say so, underground, that that is the term for the, the centralized network. component of it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in the added benefit of it is if there's ever any persecution and, or we get sued and we lose the infrastructure, huh. all the we, we we think if that were to happen, 80 percent of the microchurches would survive a catastrophic event mm-hmm. to the infrastructure because they are the church, because we've set it up to where, no, you you are the body of Christ. They would continue as being that thing mm-hmm. you know, in the world. Of course, they still need help. I, we, we're not against centralized things, so we're not completely decentralized. We see the need for shared theological expertise, mm-hmm. shared resources, right? So that type of stuff. Also, we do believe in governance. So we, we're not like, do whatever you want, Nishu. It's like, no, you can't 
exploit your people. You can't steal money. You can't sleep with the women. You know, like it's not cool, bro. And there's a there is a governance structure for that um, that that we've thought thought through quite extensively. That still allows them to have agency as microchurches, but they are in submission to a governing structure. Okay. But that governance is actually separated from the infrastructure. So the infrastructure functions as a nonprofit uh, missions agency to serve microchurches and microchurch leaders. And and that governance is separated from the like theological controversy or yeah. church discipline, which again, keeps those power lines separate. Yeah. So now you don't have people tripping, being like, why didn't you come listen to my crappy sermon? Yeah. You know, and being mad at folks for that. It's like, no, no. Let's do church discipline. Let's do theological kind of controversies and like Mm -hmm. making those decisions separate from what the budget is and the seminars that we're going to run and and that type of stuff. So, so you have I'm hearing kind of almost three entities. You have the Michael churches with their leadership or people. Then you have the infrastructure that just kind of empowers them to do that. But then you also do have a a broader um, Mm -hmm. governance that's not part of the the infra, it's not part of the infrastructure right. it, it's it's, it's a it's a collect it's, it's a part it, of the church okay yeah. and who is that is that you and lucas and uh i'm several uh, other it's people a group are... of governing elders i okay. i did serve as a governing elder um okay. for a little bit but it's a, it's just basically a board of governing elders eight to 14 okay uh people that uh, act as like a supreme court like if there's a controversy that gets kicked up okay. to them they they would make a ruling and then the churches the micro churches that have agreed to be in submission, okay. you know, that's that's a part of how they're operating in our ecosystem is they've agreed. They've come in and said, yes, I like all of this. I agree type of thing. Okay. Then then they have to either be in submission to what the, the governing elders are saying okay. uh, or or they are welcome to leave at that point. And, but, you know? and you guys are not it sounds like you're not at all micromanaging the nuts nope. and bolts of the gathering. But if one spun off into some cult and they all started flying down to Mexico, you yeah. know, and <laughs> drink some potion away. Like you, you would, you have, you have the authority to kind of keep them in check on just a really big, broad, you know, yes. heretical type possibilities, cultish type, whatever. Uh, yeah. People Somebody says, around. Hey, we want to start studying the Bhagavad Gita in order to obtain truth, Okay, you know, like life, truth and salvation towards mm-hmm. the father. We'd be like, that's, that might be an issue because we're exclusive claims of Jesus yeah. kind of folks. And you agreed to that up front. You knew that up front, and now you've deviated from that. Let's okay. have a conversation. The benefit of the governing elders not having to worry about the staffing or the budgets or the facilities or anything like that, they could they could focus on the people. Yeah. They could focus in on like, man, like let's have a conversation. We, we had one brother that was – we've had several elders have affairs, you know, like step out on their marriages. And so it's like now you have to go to them and you have to, you know, the governing elders go to those leaders of the microchurches and say, man, let's let's talk about discipline. Let's talk about restoration. Let's get both sides of the story, mm-hmm. you know, that type of stuff and, and just kind of do an investigation uh, into those matters. Um, but we're going to give you a restoration process, a discipline and restoration, kind of a modern epistle. We're okay. going to write this letter to you. And this is kind of our our decision as a collective group. But at the end of the day, it's caring for people still. It's not just trying to enforce yeah. some dogma or policy or something like that. It's it's a board of people saying, we want to love these people as best we can. Um, and the only authority that the governing elders really has is the authority that's given to them yeah. by the people, right? So they, they have no exercise, you know, they can't exercise any other authority other than Hey man, we're we're recommending that you do this, mm-hmm. and um, you can either listen to us or, or not. But if you don't listen to us, then you're no longer a part of the underground network. So that would be the only yeah. like last straw. Uh, we've only ever had to remove. Uh, I always round up six because I okay. can't remember six. I can only remember three microchurches. So we've helped over 500 microchurches be planted oh. in the Tampa Bay area, 500? and we've only ever had. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought now, you the, said the something last, like thirty or something earlier, but was that well? Eighty, eighty currently eight, exist. Okay. Yeah, like they have life cycles, right? So some have spin off and they, they, they move or you know, you know how it is. Yeah. Uh, people move around and in, in transient. I mean, we've been doing it for fifteen years, so okay. you know, people, have, um, or they're still going, but they, 
their their social fabric is really connected to another faith community, like a First Methodist down the road. And so they really take what we helped incubate and plant, and then they they basically live that out over there with the First Baptist or something. And we're just happy for that. So they're no longer part of our network, but they're still being the church. Mm-hmm. Um, but then also some microchurches come in and out of life, right? There's life cycles to it. Um, so something starts and then, you know, it, two years later, okay. it passes away. Yeah. And that's okay, too, for us. Um, we also, during the past five years, had a pretty major division. So that's that's pretty fun. Like many like many groups yeah. in, in the United States. So we've had to navigate those waters. Are you able to so talk right about now, that publicly it, or is it probably not, right? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that the public doesn't need to know about that or and, and I'm not I'm not looking yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be, I'm not I, looking I, to I, dig I'm not looking for God. No, I got I'll, enough I'll gossip dis- on my plate. I, I'll we'll always be discreet. I'm just curious how you handled that. Yeah. I cried a lot. Hmm. Yeah, it was it was great. <laughs> we, we think it's an inherent vulnerability to decentralized networks that there is that tension of schism, that tension of, you know, it's easier to keep people in line or alignment when there's one hierarchy, one voice, one building, one meeting. But now you've just diversified everything. And as you diversify things, ethnic, political, you know, uh, economic class – educational, you know, it's, so all of our microchurches are very different. You know, we got people that didn't graduate high school. They're major drug runners in the panhandle. They're leading a microchurch now, you know, (laughs) and they're awesome and they're incredible leaders and it's an incredible microchurch. But that, that dude's very different than the lawyer who served in the military has mm-hmm. multiple advanced degrees and plants a church in a double gated community. Mm-hmm. It's like not just one gate, but two gates. <laughs> you, you know, there's a gate to keep the gated people out, right? A double gated community. So those dudes are like polar opposites, right? So now they're now they're sitting in this ecosystem, playing together, being the church. How do they how do they not fight? Right? So this this is this is the inherent vulnerability of a decentralized network. There's every reason to separate, mm-hmm. you know, uh, way, way more than the what music style or something like that, um, like found you know, methodology. So we have microchurches reaching, you know, LGBTQ communities, but they disagree on the methods by which they're reaching them. Right. So even it's like, oh, we're reaching the same demographic. Mm-hmm. What are you doing over there? You know, now they're fighting. So there's okay. this massive temptation to fight at every level, it's an inherent vulnerability, yeah. and um, and so we we saw that uh, you know with all the polarization, all the catastrophization, all the kind of um, kind of the social anxiety folks went through, we we saw some of that happen to us. You know, people just kind of yeah. adopted that anxiety and just said, "Hey, I don't want to I don't want to be with people who are different from me." anymore so it really was and, the uh, the polarization in the last couple of years you guys felt that too i mean that, that's i don't i haven't talked to a pastor yet that hasn't had these major decisions right. happen so you guys weren't immune to that either no no yeah we weren't we weren't immune to it and um i i think we would deal with it differently i think we, mm-hmm. we it's like oh okay we could see the signs mm-hmm. uh probably a little bit better a little bit more wise um uh, but i i also think Man, in the moment, you're just trying to love people, mm-hmm. trying to listen to people, trying to suffer alongside people. Um, and we probably made a lot of mistakes or it was very clunky. But I think the heart ultimately and the way that we walked with folks as they were leaving, you know, they didn't know they were leaving at first, but it eventually it became the trajectory was leaving. Um, we just tried to be as gracious and mm-hmm. loving and just be like, bless them. There's folks we gave money to to start new things, and and these were like divisionists, people like rec- actively recruiting people to cause division, you know, alter narratives, alter history kind of stuff, and um, we were just like, man, we just bless you, hmm. Can, you know. It sounds like what you're doing. Can we give five thousand dollars to that? Hmm. We just want to bless you as you leave, and so we we tried our best. Not perfectly, yeah. but that was our, our posture towards it. And um, at the end of it, though, I think we came back to a sense of 
we got to be who God's calling us to be, which is an ecosystem that plants microchurches that are called by God to do mm-hmm. the things that he's doing in the world. Do, do you think if if um, if you if you did have more of a central gathering, some of this could have been pre- prevented or at least addressed? I'm just I'm thinking out loud. I'm just thinking like if you had a, an, a somewhat of a, an authoritative uh, yeah. spiritual voice, they can get 90 percent of the people in one room and say, hey, look, here's what's going on. Here's yeah. where we're at. You know, yeah. but you're relying on just dozens of individual leaders to try to like shepherd their people. Mm-hmm. I, I'm just wondering, could, but then I mean, my, my pushback to myself on that even question is like, well, loads of churches that have a central gathering went through the same stuff. And <laughs> yeah, but. no, the only, the only thing that we could have maybe done is, is powered up on the micro churches. Basically say, you're no longer the church. Come to this thing. You have to listen to this voice, this thing, this message. Um, you know, and and get in line type of thing. So there's lots of kind ways to do that, but that's typically the playbook mm-hmm. of saying alignment. You must align to me. You know, and usually it's one central voice or yeah. one central figure, right? And I think ultimately that would have actually destroyed the underground. That would have just, you know, that would just, you know, it, my metaphor is like we're just building a sandbox for missionaries to play in. And that would have just taken like a, a drum of oil and dumped it into the sandbox and just said, you know, here you go, play with this. Because it's all about them hearing from Jesus, them being the church they're called to be, us coming as like servants of the church. And now we're flipping that. And I think that would have been, yeah, I can um, see that. that would have had natural consequences that would have been actually destroy the underground versus this, which is, this is catastrophic. This is hurtful, but there's, you know, post-traumatic growth that can come out of it. Right. Uh, Because we, we kept, we kept to our convictions. Hey man. Um, But, but you're right. Uh, To the point though, there were any of our central gatherings was like gasoline to the fire. So we, as we did centralized gatherings, I got up one time and I just on the microphone I just prayed the scriptures, right? And Lucas, who's the executive director of the infrastructure, he got emails about, you know, how dare we have a white dude power up and like take the microphone from? And it was like I didn't take the microphone. I, none of that. I just prayed the Bible, mm-hmm. and it was just like anything that was ever done that was ever seen as different than whatever I was, Mm -hmm. my ideas or my, my political views or whatever, Yeah, you know, we were advocating for a a black conference, you know, a bunch of black leaders and, you know, get up and basically say, Hey man, you know, black leaders, here's, here's a kind of a conference designed for you, run by you just for you type of thing. It's a black only space type of thing and had a major donor just livid coming up to me, you know, just like, how dare you? This is racism Mm. type of stuff. And, uh, you know, we lost that dude, Mm. you know? (laughs) Uh, so it, so it's like anything. And that was at a main gathering. So it's like, you you think the main gathering would would potentially be a solution, but it was like Mm. anything we did at a main gathering in this time period became like this lightning rod of just like, see how evil they are, see how evil the underground is. And it's like, Okay, come next week, it'll be different, you know. Um, so, so did so, a lot of this? I'm hear, hearing a lot of this had to do with kind of the politicized racial conversation um, that was happening. That was just one years. expression. One, okay. yeah, it was just one expression. Yeah, it, it was a big one because yeah. I mean that's that is a big one in our country. But we're we're very multi ethnic in, in our. I mean, I'm a white dude that looks like a cop, so <laughs> I I get that there's a lot of barriers. You know, yeah. <laughs> just visually right. uh, with me. Um, but yeah, we've been since the late 90s, we've been like really pursuing racial reconciliation. Mm-hmm. Our governing elders, our board at, at every level, not just representation, but actually like really getting into the 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 deeper levels of racial reconciliation beyond just having voices at a table. Yeah. Which I think is like, you know. That's that's more like a basic understanding, mm-hmm. but some of the deeper kind of like no, let's actually reconcile mm-hmm. and create something that is multicultural, mm-hmm. not just 
a, some version of assimilation or uh, looking to colonize or convert right. people to to me or convert people to you, yeah. but actually somehow in the in the middle of it become multi ethnic. So you, know? you have mul- uh, uh, diversity at the leadership level. Cause I, oh yeah, that's yeah. that's it's hard to yeah, it's hard to be genuinely multi ethnic if if a bunch of yeah if, if the leadership mm-hmm. is mono ethnic right. I mean that's yeah. That's great. Yeah. Uh, where, where did that come from? Is that you said it was, it's always been, kind of been that way, but that something had to have sparked that, or because that's not that's the most yeah, churches the, don't the naturally 90s, <laughs> form that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Brian Sanders, just within a varsity Christian fellowship, you know, they're just very connected to growing in love with every ethnicity and culture, mm-hmm. and just seeing the the heart of God uh, in through and around uh, the differences in mm-hmm. in culture and ethnicity. They, and they have a history before it was popular to make radical choices for reconciliation and yeah. integration back in the fifties, sixties that, I mean, they, they've just lost millions and millions of dollars, you know, <laughs> it's just taken a lot of flack because they've just made choices that are righteous um, based yeah. on Ephesians, based on Romans, just saying, Hey, no, this is the scripture. Mm-hmm. And in a varsity is very Bible nerdish, yeah. but because it's Bible nerdish, it finds its way into these other, uh, conversations, uh, you know, so that, that was the beginning of it. And we just said, Hey, we're committed to this. CT Vivian was an influence on Brian. Uh, he's a civil rights leader and activist. Um, you know, he's passed away now, but, uh, so in the late nineties, that was true. And then, uh, uh, studying, uh, uh, good forms of liberation theology and black liberation theology. Mm-hmm. So some, some theological influences there, mm-hmm. Um, so from an intellectual standpoint, there's this, there's this draw, this influence, but then also practically on campus, um, working with black students and Latino students and Asian students. And just, again, not knowing how to do it perfectly, but saying, Hey, something about the kingdom here, Mm -hmm. let's, let's move into this way. And, you know, living in a black and brown neighborhood for since 97, you know, um, John Perkins, you know, CCDA, but, but just more like the three R's, racial reconciliation, redistribution of wealth and relocation mm-hmm. uh, for the sake of the gospel. Uh, so those things are like, that's the late 90s. And then just what happens if you do that for 20 years? Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're really looking at your systems. You're really looking at your relationships. And part of the thing is, how do I help, you know, Evie Sikajipo or Cece do Mom Africana? I'm a white dude that looks like a cop. They want to mentor black male school girls. How do we set up a system? Mm-hmm. Not just like I encourage them and then I teach them how to make disciples who look like me, mm-hmm. but how do I help them not just feel like validated in that calling to be black women mentoring black girls, but how do I systemically get behind them in a way where I don't force my form of discipleship on them? And that the underground ecosystem does that. That's again why we're committed to saying – be the church you're called to be, worship community mission, now you have to figure out who are you going to reach? How are you going to reach them? What discipleship plan are you going to design? Like we can coach you, but at the end of the day, we can't tell you, right? So we could give you resources. We could do a seminar, but I can't, I don't know if you should come to this seminar because what if it has nothing to do with discipling black girls? So you have to make that decision, that choice. You have to have that agency. So that keeps... Yeah. You know, guys like me kind of in a box to say, hey, I can't overstep my my authority, my boundaries, which undermines a lot of the colonization that we see or the the, you know, just kind of, you know, me just being me, you mm-hmm. know, and mm-hmm. that's I'm not, you know, the worst thing in the world. But I also probably shouldn't tell Cece how to disciple black girls. Right? Like I've discipled lots of people, but it would be inappropriate for me to be like, let me tell you how to do this, CC. Mm-hmm. Right. And and so even systemically, we've really wrestled with that at very deep levels. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Even pay structures, uh, redistribution of wealth through pay structures and fundraising policies and stuff like that. So the, it's not perfect. But yeah. It's just we're 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 very committed to it. Well, that's me- I mean, it's super messy and complicated. The fact that you guys are been pursuing that for a while i mean that that's that's pretty profound i mean you've made a con like before it was kind of popular because i feel like there's a definitely a growing number of churches Mm -hmm. leaning into some kind of ethnic reconciliation as part of their ecclesiology um but that you know prior to 20 years ago i think it was the book um 
divided by faith that really kicked off a lot. <laughs> I think that was kind yeah. of a eye opener to a lot of people. Um, so that's wow. That's um, that, that's that's encouraging actually. What well, what well, um. You, so you know the guys at We Are Church, Francis Chan, Kevin, those guys. Mm-hmm. Is what you're doing very similar to them, or what would be what would be some overlap and what would be some yeah. differences? Not not that the differences are right or wrong, just like if somebody went to your Temp Underground yeah. and hung out with them, like what would they what would they see? <clears throat> yeah, we're we're definitely unique, but uh, man, we we just really love those guys. I think the biggest difference would they would be more um, homogeneous. Okay. And the way they set up their their house churches or their micro churches. Okay. Um, and we're we're more heterogeneous. So we 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 really embrace what we would, might call biodiversity within our ecosystem, our missional ecosystem, because we say, hey, worship community mission. That's the church. Okay. You have a calling to be this thing, man. How can we help you? So like that's the that's the beginning of the conversation okay. for us. We're, we're going to try to help you. So even someone who's very immature, but they have a sense like, I feel like God's calling me to, to be the church in this way and you know, worship community mission. Well, we might say, well, you know, what do you think about incubating that in someone else's microchurch? Because it seems like you, you don't really meet the qualifications of an elder. Like you're living with your girlfriend. This was an actual case, right? It's like yeah. you're living with your girlfriend. You don't really meet the qualifications of an elder. Uh which, which would be one of our base kind of conversations with a microchurch leader, like you, you should meet this qualification. But we're not going to tell you no. We're going to say, yes, you should do the thing that God is asking you to do, but maybe incubate that in another microchurch, you know, until until you're ready, right? Mm-hmm. So, so we have these workarounds for stuff like that. But for, at the most part, we just go, if you, you have the craziest ideas to be the church, hula hoop for Jesus or – the solo mom things with a raccoon and squirrels or whatever, you know, <laughs> um, it, it, you know, and even the ideas, the plans for it might not even be that great. Mm-hmm. It, you know, like if you came here, I'd be like, Oh, Preston, don't look at these micro churches. They're kind of scrappy, you know? <laughs> um, but they're so beautiful. Uh, we're, uh, we are church from my understanding, they're they're much more homogeneous. Okay. It's they look very similar. The way they go about mission, the way they build community is very similar. The the vetting process for the leadership yeah. is much more extended, uh, where ours is is very small. Um, so we we would borderline on laying hands on too quickly. Uh, okay. I don't think we do, but we would borderline on that. That we would, we would make a lot of people uncomfortable okay. uh, at how fast we just give permission to people. So we bias towards yes, and they bias, and I would say they bias towards um, let's see type of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let, let's see, you know, be faithful, go through this pipeline, go through this training type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so then you don't see their biodiversity. Their their microchurches look very similar to one another, and they are. They're designed to reach who they're reaching. Yeah. But if they want to reach, and this is the conversation I've had with them, if you want to reach people that you're not currently reaching, mm-hmm. then you have to gain biodiversity. Like I, the microchurches I lead cannot disciple black middle school girls in the school system. It's not designed for that. Hmm. We need a different type of microchurch to do that, hmm. which means it probably can't be led by me or look like me. It probably is going to have a different discipleship pathway than me. Mm-hmm. And we have to, so how do we make sense of that or allow for it? And, and those are the conversations I usually have, have with them. Yeah. And, uh, Francis tried to break it. He was, he was just like very, very, uh, humbly and intriguingly disturbed by our, our, our ecclesial minimum. <laughs> he was kind of like, like, man, what, you know, he's trying to work it out in his head. Like, Okay, is that the? Ch- He's like, yeah, that, in a minimum way, that is the church, you know. So yeah. I, I think that's been a really great conversation, yeah, uh, with them. Why, um, when you said you you would err on the side of laying it hands too quickly, obviously you're not like trying to do that, but that would be where no. you might. Um, <clears throat> but what's the why? Why not? Um, screen leaders a little more ferociously, for lack of better terms. Like, what would be the hesitancy of? not lane or, or well, I think you know what I'm just saying. releasing, releasing yeah. people too too quickly. Yeah. It, like, like yeah. why, why not err on the other side? Is, is it because you wouldn't achieve? I think I hear you saying like 
in order to achieve this biodiversity. Um, yes. We have to take some risks in empowering people that from my white middle class background might be like, oh, I don't know if this, you know, is leader yeah. qualified, but I think they are. But let's let's take a chance. Um, is that to achieve the biodiversity and, and diversity of different missional um, outlets? Mm -hmm. Is that why you would err on the side of laying hands too quickly? Yeah. Yeah. It's just a natural consequence. The more that you you require you constrict missional possibility. It's a natural consequence. It will, it'll just happen. Uh, it, you know, the more that you get permission, then you'll increase missional possibility. Okay. Uh, so we still constrict it. So we only let people who are Christians. Luzanne Covenant's our faith kind of document. Okay. We have manifesto values. You have to agree to all these values. There's 18 of them. They don't fit on a T-shirt. Yeah. You know, okay. it's it's just there's quite a few values. So you could say, I love 15, but these three I don't love. I say, well, that's great. You should do what you're called to do. We only know how to help microchurches who value these things. Okay, that's the only microchurches we know how to help. Um, so we're sorry, we we can't help you. Um, and that that's how that conversation would go. Again, if you if you add more requirements or like a year long process of vetting mm -hmm. or testing systems, you usually get people that look like the originers, uh, you know, mm -hmm. originals of the that system. Um, or you just massively constrict what possibilities. Huh. We're not opposed to that. We're just saying we've chosen, you know, this this path of of saying, hey, let's have mission, let's have freedom, let's bias towards yes, mm -hmm. and and really go for it and build a system that's actually designed for that. Yeah. And then we'll deal with the handful of problems. And it, I can't emphasize this enough, Preston. It's really just a handful. Really? So I, well, that's my think, next question. Like how, how many yeah. leaders due to their immaturity um, have kind of botched or, you know, gotten off the rails with certain things and had lives affected by that. You're saying that actually, while you've erred on the side of maybe being a little more risky, that the fallout has not been massive. No, no. Cause if they're playing games, God doesn't give them people to shepherd. Hmm. So that that's one, like the microchurch actually never forms. We say, man, you should do what God's calling you to do. And they're like, oh, okay. You know, and they, they try to like lead a microchurch, but they have no authority. They have, God's not actually calling them to do it, right? So people actually never join this microchurch. If they get funky, because we have, we don't assign people to microchurches, they have to go find those people, right? They have to gather those people, they have to go reach people. But if they get weird, because they chose to join that group, they don't stay in that group. Mm -hmm. Right. They, they'll they leave that. group. <laughs> They're like, this is getting weird, man. I'm leaving. And so that group dies. So God kills, you know, those things quite quickly. Unless it could turn so, into a cult, though. Right. And they could. Get... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. You haven't you had know. that happen yet. though. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing. <laughs> no, no, not yet. Um, and, and I mean, maybe you could even some outsiders might look in and say, well, they've tried. It definitely <laughs> they've tried to create some cult. <laughs> but we you know we have the Luzan, we have a front door of Luzan Covenant. So the edges of our sandbox are Luzan Covenant. So that's an evangelical global yeah, faith yeah, statement. Yeah, yeah. Our manifesto values are I mean, they're pretty deep. They're pretty comprehensive and profound. And we just tell people, like, did your heart move when you when you read these? Because mm -hmm. it's really a heart thing, not like an intellectual thing. Mm -hmm. There's a leadership covenant. This is where submission comes into play. So if you've already agreed to all this, okay. you're probably not a cult leader. Right, you know? right. Um, you're probably not just somebody playing around, playing some kind of games. So that's why already that weeds out quite a few people. We put that in front of folks, and they'll they'll fess up and say, yeah, that's not really me, or I'm not so sure about this type mm -hmm. of stuff. And so they never – they never get in the sandbox with us. Uh, and, and we found, again, most people that do get in, it's just a handful. And surprisingly, and we've seen this in the regular church world, the people that have passed all the tests, they've been around super long. Right. They still go off the rails. Right, right, totally. They yeah, still go yeah, kind of yeah. Yeah. So some of, some of our best disciples that have done everything that – you know, for 15 years, they became some of the biggest divisionists hmm. in our ecosystem. So it's like, yeah. you know, have walked away from Jesus. Yeah. Like it's, it's shocking. And they were, they were theologically trained and they were like, these were, they would have passed the assessments, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, in other contexts. So, so for us, you know, 
We've also been really wrong. People that would have failed some kind of assessment or vetting process, they end up being some of our best missionaries. But they have to be given time yeah. to develop. But we, there's so many reasons to say no up front. Mm-hmm. Just, ah, no, or not yet. Yeah. Or, well, the classic, ex- the classic example, I'm sure this is written somewhere in your documents, I mean, is Jesus and the Twelve. Like, he literally handpicked probably one of the worst <laughs> yeah. on paper group of people to change the world, you know? But that, 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 that had, that has, there's just like an intentionality there too. Like God will use yeah. the foolish to shame the, the, the wise and, and the weak to shame the strong. And I think there is that kind of upside down kingdom built into the very way in which Jesus wants to operate and change the world. That doesn't mean you, <laughs> you know, empower immoral people in the leadership obviously but right. um to to take kind of unlikely candidates um yes i'm 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 yeah that that, that excites me you know and, I, and, I've and seen... one out of 12 is a judas so one yeah. out of 12 is a judas and i would say our percentages are better than that hmm. so you know whatever what does that mean you got one up on Jesus. <laughs> yeah. How, how rare is that? <laughs> oh, I want to. Um, just kidding. Please can, don't. <laughs> can we change? Don't email me about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, can we uh, switch directions just a little bit? So you've yeah. been talking about Tampa Underground, what you guys are doing. Do, have you thought about just the the more the broader church? Maybe it's the American church. Maybe you probably not speak so broadly like the global church. But like as you look at the church in America, are there things? you guys are doing and I'm, I'm gonna put words in your mouth like you're probably gonna be yeah. you know like we're not prescribing this is the model for everybody but like they're, they're you know late at night i'm sure there's got to be some things where you look around at the broader church and like man i really feel like here's some things that we have ex- seen that have been really big wins for the gospel that i do think that other churches should kind of integrate into their yeah. models uh if if that makes sense like like speak broadly yeah. to the post covid church that we're yeah trying to figure out yeah w- one of my main jobs right now is to speak with people in, you know, inquiring about underground stuff or micro churches with kind of trans local folks so mm-hmm. that that's my primary work with the underground they've kind of outsourced okay. it to me and said <laughs> you know we want to focus on local stuff you you talk to people so all around the world so i, I want to pr- propose that I know what I'm talking about. I just say, here's what I'm hearing from people okay. from all over the world that's resonating. Um, the, the sense of calling to the everyday person, actually believing that these regular everyday people can be John 10 sheep. They can hear the good voice of the shepherd inviting them into his purposes. So that's like one of the keys. One of the keys that unlocks the, the stuff. The priesthood of believers is unlocked by the voice of Jesus, not by your strategies or your programs. It's like, man, get people to hear the voice of God and ask him, Lord, what part do I need to play in your purposes? So that's, again, one piece that seems to really resonate with a lot of folks that they just don't integrate or normalize in their, their regular structures. It's like, no, I normalize it all the time. Like, God, I want to hear from you. I want to hear your voice. We study the Bible. I don't want to just apply this Bible. I want to hear your voice through this word, you know, and then I want to respond to it in some kind of way. So that, that seems to be really big. Um, the other is the, the, in every context, finding the version of saying, biasing towards yes. So in some context, that'll be, much more restrictive than our context, right? Uh, we're more free with that. But in their context, and however that makes sense, they're pushing the edge of saying yes to people. So people here are calling, and however it makes sense, you are giving people permission to obey that sense from Jesus, mm-hmm. right? So that seems to be, and then giving people framework or language to understand what that means. So it's some type of ecclesial minimum, worship, community, mission. You can add more things to it. The more you add, the fewer you'll get Mm -hmm. or the less biodiversity you'll have. So if you add 21, you'll, you know, don't cry about it. You'll just get the natural consequence of having 21 minimums Mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, you'll have three microchurches (laughs) or something, you know, and Mm -hmm. and that might be all that God is asking you to do. So I'm not even saying you shouldn't do that. I'm just saying that's a natural consequence. Mm -hmm. Like have have the framework 
that helps people respond to Jesus and you're giving them permission to do it, right? That seems like globally, I don't know, illuminate, unlock folks. Uh, I get it that there's complicated systems, yeah. denominations, his, historical practices, but well, I'm talking to Anglicans. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking to like high up Anglicans. Mm-hmm. So I'm going, I mean, if they're thinking about it, <laughs> you know, so we, you, I, yeah. I'm hearing you saying like like churches should maybe explore more opportunities to empower their body to um, yeah. live more missionally, not just attend church, not just become an individual faithful disciple, but God has given you gifts, gifts, uh, desires, yeah. callings. Like, how can we come alongside you and empower you? Is that what, like like yes, churches should do yes more. because because if you do that, then you'll have problems to solve. <laughs> right. So so people start saying yes and now they're hitting barriers or now you're like empowering people who are like a bit sketchy, you know. <laughs> so you're going, okay, now we have a problem. So now we could get into the governance. Now we could get into the training. Now we could get into like what products and services do we offer these people to help them? What m- menu do we give folks? Oftentimes people have it reversed. They want to design a menu to help empower people, but I'm going, no, no, no. The empowerment mm-hmm. comes from the Holy Spirit calling people, them listening you giving permission to do what God is telling them mm-hmm. to do and some type of framework to make sense of it, some type of clarity around that. Um, that will get people moving. And now from that place, people can go, oh, oh my gosh, what do we do with this now? Mm-hmm. There's people actually trying to obey Jesus and it's messy and it's complicated and confusing to us. Mm-hmm. How do we make this fit our current systems, our budget, all that stuff? Mm-hmm. But I'd rather people have an actual problem they have to deal with, yeah. which is people obeying Jesus to be his church. <laughs> and then later figuring out like, okay, now we have to figure out how do we do a budget for this? Do you, do you think that's actually possible with the current structure of most churches? And what I mean by that is, and this isn't, I'm not trying to say this negatively necessarily. It's just kind of, it is what it is. Like w- when, yeah churches are set up to so much time and energy and personnel is investing their time and energy and gifts into making the Sunday service happen, which I right. think, and there's data on this, I think, where it's like, if you add up the yeah. budget, how much, how, how much percentage of <clears throat> yeah. your budget, your personnel, your time throughout the week is devoted to the Sunday morning service. There's little space for, I mean, to explore this whole other yeah. thing of, okay, how can we empower a thousand people under our care to live on mission yeah. with the gifts God's given them. I don't have time for that. You know, that's ooh, okay. I already got, you know, yeah. sermon to prepare for. I've got like someone to bury <laughs> on Friday. I've got meetings all day Monday. My wife's going to leave me cause I'm working too many hours. You know, I, yep. um, but that's, that's a fundamental structural problem that if we open that yeah. up a little bit, it would open up more space. Is that, are you seeing that as a, as a hurdle? If somebody's so wrapped up in the service? Yeah, there, there's basically five major milestones for a pre-existing faith community to transition to what we would say is a parallel system where you do have kind of consumables, like you hold on to some of your historical legacy stuff. So the mm-hmm. choir, or maybe even the Sunday service or stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And it's designed for people just coming to consume that. Right. But you also develop a missional, a parallel missional system. And of course, those things can overlap. You, you'd have like a Venn diagram. But there's there's probably five, at least at least five kind of milestones that have to be transitioned. One of the very first ones is what's your conviction? Like, what is God actually asking you to shift? Like, don't don't shift whatever he's not asking you to shift. And I say that to mega churches and multi sites. It's like. No, no, don't just copy me. Don't don't just change something because you read a book or because your thing isn't currently right. working. Change what has to change because King Jesus has invited you to make a change. Mm-hmm. And that that might be a prayer and fasting process, that might be a year-long exploration process, but it's like what is Jesus convicting you to change? Mm-hmm. That's one of the very first milestones. And folks that just try to start changing stuff to be more effective or more trendy or get more, you know, they want to get back to the mega church status. So they want to pivot to the micro church method to get back to that status. And it's just like, no, 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 no. Has Jesus asked you to do any of this? Right. Mm-hmm. Because what if it doesn't work? 
Because some some people obey Jesus and they get sawn in two and disemboweled. <laughs> like that's that's faith. Yeah. So just because you make a shift doesn't mean it's actually going to be successful or work or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, no, Jesus has invited me to Golgotha. He's invited. He's invited me to come die, and the thing that we lead currently may actually be on that path. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But yeah. we should obey him anyways. So, so it is a bit of a disruptive moment. I mean, I hope that's not true, but it's just one of those moments where you go. But what if it is? What if? What if it's not successful, but it is purely obedient? Yeah. Then great, you should do that. So I, I was, um, and I think I, I think this is all fairly public, but like um, I was part of, a, I arrived at Cornerstone Church where Francis used to pastor, literally the same week when they they completely inverted the entire system. Um, mm-hmm. So they tried to t- decentralize everything. They um, and in Simi Valley where we were at, it was a mm-hmm. it's it's a six mile by four mile grid. Everything's just a big grid. So they literally divided the entire city into like, okay, this neighborhood, this this square half a mile is your new community, and you're gonna hang out and do mission with the believers in that community and in, in that space. And if you live here, that's your church. If you live here, we're still gonna do the central gathering. But I think they canceled like all the men's stuff, women's stuff, pretty much overnight because that's what. Francis does. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he just like, yeah. hey, let's yeah. do that. Bam, it's done. You know, let's make a um, change. Yeah, and I, um, on paper, it looked amazing. Practically, mm-hmm. I don't. Yeah. I wouldn't. And I think this is where I. I, th- I think the, the the leaders there would would have publicly said, "Man, ah, we made some bad decisions." And I, th- I think mm-hmm. there's a few things that they wish they did differently. Maybe not change things so quickly. Maybe prepare people ahead of time, and maybe. Um, have d- done a slower transition to where you're preparing leaders ahead of time. So it wasn't just this radical thing where people are like, what are we doing now? What yeah. happened? How come I don't have men's Bible yeah. study next week or whatever? And so I think people just, it, it was just a little shock to the mm-hmm. system. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah. So all, all that to say like that, that I do as much as some of these more radical revisiting the structures, like really good on paper. And I personally, I'm, have an iconoclastic kind of like tendency. So I'm like, yeah, let's do that. But yeah. man, seeing it on the ground from a congregant, I'm like, oh, I could, and you talk to people in here and it's like, oh man, it's it's trying to wean people off of maybe unhealthy or less effective rhythms of church. That's complicated, yeah. you know? Um, and, and not all the reasons for wanting a church service are bad, you know? Um, no, they're not, they're not all bad. Yeah. And, th- and these are people God has given you to care mm-hmm. for. So even if you're making big changes, there still has to be this concern for the entire community. You may not retain the entire community, but you should be concerned for the entire community. And mm-hmm. that's why we've identified those those kind of five five thresholds. Um, but I wouldn't. It, it, that's that seems in line with kind of what we our church kind of does a little bit more, which is right. they're assigning people. Like Francis was so concerned. I've only had one conversation with him, so I don't really know. Him. But uh, Mr. Chan, you know, um, he he was so concerned about the quality of the groups because they, at that point, they're at least they're basically assigning people to the group, you know, okay. which is something I would never take responsibility for the quality of a microchurch because I don't give people to it. Like those those are grown folks; they could go to that thing or not. If that thing is terrible, don't go to it, you know. Like I don't; right. it doesn't have to be good. Yeah. For us, we're we're okay with a lot of failure or mediocrity, as people are learning, you know. Yeah. So, as you assign people, if you're telling people, "Hey, we're all pivoting to this missional system overnight," mm-hmm. you know, this decentralized structure overnight, but there's no sense of calling. There's no sense of like age. They don't have agency in it. Yeah. Again, this is this is where it's like, oh, you're still undermining the priesthood of believers, uh, unintentionally, like right. with good yeah, intentions. Yeah. It's still kind of happening. Yeah. And I would just say, man, that's why it's probably a bit of a process. And that's why I would say you, at the end, you're probably going to end up with a, a dual operating system. If you have a pre existing faith community, you'll probably end up with a dual operating system um, with certain percentages of like you're still, you still have an operating system that looks very similar to the mm-hmm. consumable kind of system that, that pre existed. Right. Yeah. Uh, but but it's based but the people that you're going to have in the missional system are there because 
they're called to be there because they want to be there. Like they, they've made the move to the other thing that takes time. And it takes like people hearing from Jesus Mm -hmm. to participate in it. And then of course you you have the problem of like, okay, what do we do to support those people? And that's where the, that, that other half the system starts being built. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. I have a diagram that works for it, but (laughs) yeah, it does. It does. Um, I got two more questions. You got time or do you have uh... no, man, I got time. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Run into micro church, man. You don't have any meetings to get to or no <laughs> staff development. No, man, not, not on Tuesdays. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so I got to formulate my question. It has to do with belonging. How, how it, it seems to me in my anecdotal experience that one of the yeah. primary things people are longing for and not getting in their traditional churches that they're in is this deep, genuine sense of belonging. I mean, mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many people I hear from that. They, they might even like their church. Oh, the preaching's good. The worship's good. Yeah. I'm like, okay, do you, are you loved and do you love? Are you known and are you, do you know? Like if, if, you're, if you're really going through a struggle with your marriage, your kids, like, do you have a, a immediate authentic community to walk with you in this? And I get deer in the headlights, like, well, no, like I just, I, I wouldn't get that at church, you know, like, you know, um, right. do you, have you found that your model has your model, the Tampa underground mm-hmm. does foster a genuine sense of belonging? Like, do people feel like they are known and know, and they're missed when they don't, you know, they're in deep relationships with other believers. Cause I just, I, I, there's so many lonely church going Christians out there yeah. that, they're going through all kinds of stuff, you know? Yeah. I mean, um, and I, I can keep going on, but yeah, I just, yeah, I, the short, I'm, I'm the really bur- is, I'm burdened. Yes. To, I don't yeah. care what your model is. All I, all I know is if believers are going to your church over and over and over and they're missed, they're not missed, they're not known, nobody really knows yeah. them. To me, that's a primary thing that we need to foster, whatever your model is. I don't, I don't care if you have a billion people coming yeah. on Sunday morning, that's fine, whatever. But like, yeah. are people known and are they knowing others? Um mm-hmm. Well, in the microchurch, I mean, you're talking about average 14, 15 people, you know, for our, our historical ecosystem. So, yeah, man, the one couple doesn't show up and it's like, oh, oh, there's like a chunk of us missing, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and and we miss them. And, and we also know, hey, what's going on with this marriage? Like, it seems like you guys are, it's, it's mm. impossible not to notice. That's what I found. Um, now, di- microchurch is can be at different phases of development um, and phases of maturity. So, you know, it it is possible that, you know, it, it just still misses something, misses a person, makes some mistakes as far as like how to care for those people. And so you might find the occasional person be like, yeah, I just still feel like I'm not really known in this. Well, which Mm -hmm. micro church is that? Oh yeah. They're, they're still really developing. I mean, the Mm -hmm. team is developing. It's, it's fairly new. Um, so yeah, that makes sense that they don't know exactly what to do with your complicated mental health issues. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. They, yeah. They make, that makes sense. You know. Because simply <laughs> being in a room with a few people over and over doesn't. It, I think that that the uh, smaller gathering, a rhythm of gathering, yeah. Um, yeah. is more conducive for fostering organic relationships. But it doesn't guarantee it. I've been part of. Doesn't guarantee. I mean, so like, it's yeah. gonna sound bad. I, I should probably say this offline, but like. Like my wife and I, we've been parts of, you know, lots of small groups through the years. And we're just like, we, I can't, I, I'm, you should join a community group. I, no, I'm sorry. I just, I can't. Yeah. I've been there so many times and I, I just, I just can't do it anymore. I don't know. Like oh, all, man, all, I, all I have to do, to all I have to do church, to shut down a conversation <laughs> is tell people what I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And most people are like. I don't know what that means, but I'm going to go talk to this person. Oh, cool. You know, whatever. And I'm, I'm an introvert, yeah. so I don't mind that. Um, but it, I know deep down it's not healthy. Um, but I just, I don't know. I've never really been part of a, a traditional small group that it's just, they, they feel awkward. They feel forced. Christians turn into Christian mode and like, okay, dude, when do we yeah. sing and pray? You know, like when I just hang out with people, it's amazing. Yeah. And, and my, yeah. my, my most fruitful small group, my most fruitful small community feel happens when I invite a bunch of people over for drinks and snacks mm-hmm. or whatever I, you know um hey come yeah. over in an hour you guys free yeah sure okay let's come over and usually those more organic things turn into something more fruitful but when it's kind of a pre-planned community group it just feels 
it's from my experience it's just always been awkward i'm like i, I just don't have time for that but. yeah and and i to be honest there's going to be some micro churches that will be at that they're at that place of development depending on where the person what they've been exposed to in the church world they they are very churchy you know so yeah. they're they're trying to run a a churchy small group but the thing that cleans a lot of that up over time um i think i think i could say this is the microchurch having purpose, like mission, like okay, the, yeah. the the microchurch has to have mission. Like this only makes sense if either we all are about the same mission, same purpose, yeah. or we're all covenanting to be about his mission in our own spaces, right? Mm-hmm. And if that's actually happening, if like obedience is happening in that way, it, they don't even have to be good at it, but they're trying to do it. Mm-hmm. A lot of the... It, it, it becomes sober, mm-hmm. like the the micro church itself becomes less mask like, and because if you're really out there trying to reach people, if you're really working with broken people, if you're really trying to pray with other teachers, when you come back together, a lot of the the mask and the proving your Christianity, the distance, you've it's mm. it's like you actually need each other at a level. Like I need other Christians, and just the stuff that we thought was important. And the conversations we thought were important actually aren't important because I'm working with broken people over here. Right. And all of a sudden it just rearranges Mm -hmm. our sense of what is important and what the need is for each other. That happens over time. Mm -hmm. Um, Any mature microchurch, like I would say a phase three microchurch for us, um, is you would walk in, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that's what's happening here. Mm. Like I could be Preston and I could – I could say brilliant things or I could sit in the corner and it's all good. And we're not going to just pretend to know God at a level which we don't because it, it, even that, the Christian sense of, oh, I know Jesus is like, well, no, go work with some really messed up people mm-hmm. and you realize how messed up you are. And you also re- recognize like how distant you are hmm. from actually knowing the God who loves you and loves them. So the and common becomes, mission fosters more authentic, just, community among each other it cl- it cleans it up man huh. it cleans it up a lot of stuff that we just think mm-hmm. this is what it's all about it just doesn't and then and then people want to have fake little meetings mm-hmm. it just doesn't happen very long okay. i mean people again people do it but i would say that's they're more in the immature or they're early in the development of that micro church it, it's just it's a little bit more we're still pretending mm-hmm. together right yeah. and we're, we're okay with that we're okay with a microchurch kind of coming together and still playing a lot of the little Christian games and inauthentic kind of stuff that would bother me. But we just say, y- y'all just keep at it. You know, worship community mission. The Lord will sort you, you guys out. Trust us. And and we're here to coach you yeah. when that happens. <laughs> well, and typically people, human beings, homo sapiens, aren't going to make time for they, – they will make time for – for belonging, where, where where do you belong? Uh, where do you f- feel like you you know? I don't want to miss this because it's so meaningful. If they don't, if it's yeah. not, it, it doesn't have that. It's typically not going to retain attendance. You'll get it, some Christians just like, oh, I just need to be you know be part of this because that's what Christians do. But most people kind of yeah. start to fade out. I think. I mean, when something more um, meaningful comes up, they'll say they'll choose that over something that's not meaningful. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Man, I, I do have more questions, but I've taken you well over an hour in my other podcast, uh, which is with my oh, wife, <laughs> is waiting upstairs. So I got she's like, are you done yet? So um, like, hurry Jer- up, man. Yeah, <laughs> dude, it was so great getting to know you and let's stay in contact. And uh, yeah, love what you guys are doing out there. It's just intriguing. If anything, I know it's not perfect. It's messy, but I, I, do, I admire anybody who's just trying to explore just fresh ways of being the people of God. So thank you for what you're doing, man. Yeah, um, man. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate appreciate you guys. So you, you, you and Chris keep at it. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll do, man. It, yeah. If anybody wants to reach out, tampaunderground.com, yes. you know, undergroundnetwork.org, uh, just just reach out and say, hey, man, I need a conversation about this stuff. Or, But if it's like hate mail, like don't send that. You can send it to like, me. I, I got a whole inbox. Yeah, send it to Preston. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bro. Take care, man. Yeah. God bless you. This show.
show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.